Good evening. I would like to welcome you to, or welcome everyone to the Center of International Studies and the Program on the Global Environment uh, speaker series, Naturalizing Disaster, Vulnerability, Nature, Vulnerability, and Social History. Uh, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I want to just uh, begin with a couple announcements. First, um, I just learned that we have a senior BA thesis or senior BA thesis poster presentation next week. It'll be from four to six in this room. Um, I was told it'll be an extravaganza, so I highly recommend attending. It should be quite interesting to see what kind of projects our undergraduates are working on here. Um, the second announcement I have is that uh, one of our speakers wasn't able to make it due to unforeseen uh, events, but luckily we'll be able to have you know, devote this extra time to the presentation tonight. So I, I think it's, it's going to be quite exciting. Um, our speaker series, Naturalizing Disaster, Nature, Vulnerability, and Social History, is a three-part lecture series examining the dynamics between nature, dislocation, and communities in a world that is growing increasingly vulnerable. The series examines conceptions of hazard, policies and practices, for mitigating disaster and environmental justice. The talks explore the political ecology of drought, flood, earthquake, and famine through different historical, cultural, and disciplinary contexts. And our speakers include scholars and practitioners who engage with disaster from an array of disciplinary and institutional perspectives and drawing on <clears throat> both historical and contemporary case studies. Tonight is the third and final event in the series, Disaster as Inequality equity, justice, and rights. This evening, we are very pleased and honored to announce, or to welcome Ravi Rajan, Senior Research Fellow at the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. On sabbatical from the University of California at Santa Cruz, where he is Associate Professor of Environmental Studies. Dr. Rajan holds a degree in mathematics and a master's in philosophy from the University of Delhi and a PhD in environmental history from the University of Oxford. He is also a visiting scholar, or excuse me, he's also a visiting fellow and visiting professor at the Energy and Resources Institute and University in New Delhi, and chair of the outreach committee of the American Society for Environmental History. Dr. Rajan has three broad research interests, environmentally inclusive governance, the governance of environmental risks and disaster, and green and social entrepreneurship. Beyond authoring many articles and book chapters on these issues, he's the author of the book, Modernizing Nature, Forestry and Imperial Eco-Development from 1800 to 1950. And he's in the process of completing two book projects, the first titled Engineered Conflicts, The Environment and the Politics of Expertise in Moder Modern India. The second is titled Sustenance, Security and Suffrage a theory of environmental human rights. Tonight, Dr. Rajan's presentation is titled Nature, Disaster, and Vulnerability, a Charter for Environmental Human Rights. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rajan to the University of Chicago. Thank you very much for uh, coming here on, a, on an afternoon. It's such a beautiful day when you could be outside. I will try my very best to uh, compete with nature. I, I know I won't succeed. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's odd that this is the very first time that I've actually stepped out of the airport in Chicago. I seem to pass through uh, O'Hare as, as you do when you're in danger to United, as much as I am. Uh, but it's all the more strange because my wife uh, spent about 15 years uh, in Chicago, so she's pretty much a Chicago kid. And so it's kind of strange that I've never actually left the airport. So it's, it's kind of fun to come out, and I've been walking around the campus, and what a beautiful place. You guys are lucky. I thought I was lucky um, living in Santa Cruz, but this is beautiful. Uh, what I'm going to be presenting today is um, is a kind of a cut and dry take on a book project that I hope to complete sometime next year. It's, 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 it's done in draft. And what I'm going to present is a kind of an empirical slice of it, um, devoid of a, a lot of the philosophical stuff that I am working on. Um, we went through some of this in the morning 
um, conversation with the students. And uh, I'm happy to take that in, um, uh, in, um, in questions as well. Um, what I'm interested in this book is thinking about what the idea of environmental human rights means. What does it mean conceptually? Where is it coming from? And how can it contribute to our thinking of what it is to be human in itself? It's a, it's a, it's a big canvas question. Um, I'm not alone in raising this question. It's become pretty salient right now. Uh, this slide shows, for example, um, some ways in which international bodies, multilateral United Nations type entities, raising the question of environmental human rights. So it's become a very salient part of, um, of the discourse today. Uh, but actually, if you think about it, as from a historical point of view, uh, the point, the question of environmental human rights is by no means new. Um, in one of the articles that were pre-circulated, I believe, that I wrote a while ago called Classical Environmentalism versus Environmental Human Rights, uh, part of what I argued is a very basic and commonsensical kind of idea. That if you actually go back to the birth of modernity, uh, not too long ago in, in human history, um, on the one hand, there was a very, very strong emphasis on the idea of sustainability. It goes back to Evelyn uh, in, in the case of forests. Um, and, and a lot of other attempts at trying to make sure that resource use, call bears ordinance again in France, etc. cetera. Um, and on the other hand, the dissenting imagination, if you will, um, that, that sort of looked at the underbelly of the transformations that came with industrialization, both on a cultural side of things, as well as in terms of alienation from landscapes, as well as uh, the exploitation of labor uh, came alongside the celebration of the Industrial Revolution. So you have the romantics, you have the critics of slavery. I mean, it happened at the same time. So, uh, and of course, right in the midst of it, uh, with the Lisbon earthquake, we had Voltaire. Um, that's, you know, that, that book uh, and his work speaking centrally to our very idea of disasters as a way of framing, and vulnerability is framing the very core of the modern project, if you will. So this is not an old problem at all, an old question. Um, the term environmentalism, as we talk about it today, is, is, is different from the way in which it historically was used. In the past, it's a very old word. It's been used for a very long time. But it historically, at least in the last 200 years, has meant environmental influences. Uh, so if you read up, look up the term environmentalism, uh, what, what we really are crudely talking about is theories of environmental determinism or environmental possibilism, if you will. That's what it meant. Um, it's only in the second half of the 20th century that environmentalism meant a particular kind of relationship with landscapes, notions of wildness, uh, and the associated affects, affective things, consciousness about our attitudes to non-natural, the non-natural world. That's a relatively recent development. And in in the emergence of this new ethic um, of an empathy for non-natural worlds, um, we lost for a while, for about 30 years, I think, a much longer and older tradition uh, which centered around what the quality of the environment meant to us as humans. This kind of dropped out of the agenda. Till, actually, interestingly enough, in Chicago, uh, among other places, but Chicago is certainly very central to this, the idea of environmental justice was born. Today, the concept of environmental justice has been proliferating, even in the academic uh, world, uh, there are now at least three journals that are explicitly focused on these questions. Um, the one on the left, Environmental Justice, is actually produced right here from Chicago. Um, the other one, uh, the Journal of Environment and Human Rights, um, is comes out of uh, Australia, but uh, 
and, and Britain and Australia. Um, but it's a global and a, a very, very exciting new journal that's come out. And of course, the Journal of Political Ecology has been around um, for a while now. Now, what I am asking here is a very simple question, which is, what are the direct and indirect links between the environment and human rights? What does it mean to talk about the environment and human rights? And I try and address this in this book by asking three questions, which are on the slide on the slide in front of you. What is the environmental basis of poverty? Is there one? If so, what is it? Or in other words, can we correlate economic poverty with the environment in some way? What are the environmental rights of citizens? Can we talk about rights? And what are the environmental obligations of states? These are the three fundamental questions. As you can tell, uh, the book project is a philosophical one. It, it is asking and raising big, fundamentally philosophical questions. Um, because I wasn't sure about what the audience was going to be today, I decided that I was going to keep the narrative empirical uh, and sort of tell a story uh, and hopefully uh, draw out the bigger issues as we in, in, in one slide at the end and then hopefully in the discussion that comes in. But I'll quickly summarize the broad, the broad argument, uh, uh, you know, which, which also is the title of my book. Sustenance, security, and suffrage. Uh, to me, sustenance, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of reframing the old public goods, public bads question that has been prevalent in public policy for a long time. Sustenance, I, th I define as the absence of good or sustaining environments. It's not sustainability. Right, because sustainability is about humanity and the rest of nature. Sustenance is about, sustain, about environments that sustain human life. What does that mean? Traditionally, the idea of sustenance, if you look it up in the OED, is only about food. Now, part of what I'm trying to argue here is that there is more to sustenance than food. That's one of the old points about, that's how it connects up with human rights. And I'll talk about it in more detail in a second. The second is the presence of bad environments, risky, toxic environments, the environmental justice stuff. That's security. And thirdly, suffrage, which again is the sort of great invention that we've had. You know, but asking, uh, posing a fundamental question, which is how do we account for the inability of our existing democratic structures and our institutions to provide a voice to uh, people who have been denied sustenance and security. Um, democratic, much of at least uh, suffragette democracy has been about getting people an option to elect their own representatives. And that in historical times has been revolutionary. It's barely been with us for 150 years now. And compared to any time in history, and probably most of humanity today, it is revolutionary. But Part of where we need to go, I think, and, and part of what the environmental human rights agenda should do, is to ask more fundamental questions about what does it mean to extend the concept of suffrage to our control of the environments that sustain us, or not, as the case may be. What does it mean to tweak the democratic ideal? Um, as might be obvious, uh, I, I do come very much from a classical tradition. I, I'm not apologizing for it. And since I am in Chicago, I actually began the book very strongly in support of, for example, someone like Martin Asba. And so I'm putting it out there in the sense that I do stake my thing in that pretty clearly. Uh, it's not an easy position to take. And what that means and why I do it is something I'm happy to address later on. Now, um, before we proceed, one of the key words that's been that is in the title, and it defines a lot of what I talk about, is this concept of vulnerability. And um, I'm particularly using one particular take on this, the anthropologist uh, Tony Oliver Smith, who in a 1996 review um, of the, in the annual uh, review of anthropology on disaster, it's, it's really a classic article to read in any case, um, says what's on the screen. I'm not going to read it out, but basically what he says is that a mere conjunction 
of a large catastrophic event and a large human population does not produce a catastrophe. Or in other words, we can have life-changing, disastrous events. But with a similar kind of event, some communities bounce back, others don't. Right. And the reason that some people, some communities do, and the others don't, is because those that do have had historic relationships, social systems that have been built in, embedded economic and social systems. Uh, and I use embedded in the Karl Polanyian sense of embeddedness. They've built relationships which allow them to offer reciprocity and mutuality, et cetera, of the householding, if you will, that allow them to somehow mitigate from a catastrophic event and bounce back. There are others that don't, and that's because they don't have them. And the whole point of vulnerability is about designing these systems, which are socially produced, which are produced partly by community, partly by policy, partly by deliberate scientific inputs, for, but through a variety of things, essentially. I'd like you to bear this in mind right through whenever I use the word vulnerability. I mean a historic pattern that produces or not produces, as the case may be. What I'm now going to do is run through these three concepts very quickly, the concepts of sustenance, security, and suffrage. I'm going to begin the concept of sustenance with this particular, uh, what I meant, what I probably neglected to mention is that for, for reasons of coherence of the narrative today, um, I'm going to focus all of my examples on one country, India. Uh, I come from it. I know it very well. The book does not do that. The book is comparative. It's much more global. The examples are from all over. Just to make, and I'm happy to, as I did in the afternoon, compare uh, and bring comparative dimension. Now let's start with ecological fragility, uh, which is fundamental to the survival of marginal peoples in the world. I'm, I'm throwing up a few things here. Um, statistics on soil erosion. An old problem. It's been around, been around for a very long time. Um, in the case of India, uh, the numbers are quite staggering, as I can tell. 60% of cultivated land is affected by problems of soil erosion. Um, look at the amount of topsoil that's lost, like 12 billion tons of topsoil being lost annually. Uh, not quite Haitian dimensions, but it's, it's, it's there in the same ballpark. A tremendous exploitation of groundwater, particularly because unlike other flow-based systems, including rivers, it's quite easy for a private operator, unlike, say, forests, which are controlled and can be controlled, essentially. It is possible for a private operator to just put a tube well in and draw water. Um, so it becomes a private resource, very, very hard to regulate, with the result that Average per capita water capacity availability has been precipitously declining. And if you look at the trends, even without climate change predictions, we have a severe crisis in terms of drinking water that's coming. That's very visible, clearly. Declining forest cover, this audience barely needs to know that. Um, the, uh, uh, the annual the government of India's goal is 33% of land covered. Uh, there's a lot of conflict over the actual percentage of land, but the government consensus is 19% today. Um, the actual ground proofing, and I myself have been part of a lot of ground studies on this, uh, the hard, done the hard way, actually walking the miles and counting trees and that kind of thing. Um, I don't believe there's 19% number at all, um, and we can talk about that. Um, and of course, climate change, the new, uh, the new big bully that's coming in. Um, the IPCC's uh, reports claim that a bare three degrees Celsius rise in temperature would result in uh, almost a 20% loss in wheat yields, which is catastrophic in terms of food security. So basically what we've got here is the following problem, that such ecological trends like soil erosion, groundwater availability, etc., exacerbate poverty because they most acutely impact poor people 
who are directly dependent upon, to use economists' categories, ecosystem services. The rest of us can buy ourselves, to some degree, out of these things. It's a question of price points. But for a lot of people who depend primarily on natural resource-based economies to sustain themselves, this can be catastrophic. And the challenge we've got is to design locally viable and socio-economically socio and ecologically adaptive systems to protect the livelihoods of the poor who depend upon the environment. Uh, there is a concept of inverse infrastructures, or in other words, infrastructures from the below, from, from what people need. Uh, we've got to build these infra inverse infrastructures. This, to me, this concept of inverse, in inverse infrastructure is one of the key questions of environmental governance. And again, it's something I'm happy to visit um, later on. A second dimension of sustenance is gender. And the tragedy with this slide is that it's very old, the data. And what that says, largely, is that um, despite its importance, it's been largely neglected. Uh, there's largely been one great scholar of gender and the environment. Her name is Bina Agarwal. She's a, she heads the Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi. Uh, she did some of the pioneering work that's cited here um, on uh, women headloaders and distances they have to travel and so forth. And what we basically got is on the far left are states of India, Bihar and Gujarat and Rajasthan and so forth. Um, then you got the year of the date year in which data was collected. And you've got these numbers in terms of time taken per day and distance traveled to collect basic natural resources because women were, are the providers of energy in a, in a household. Um, so if you look at the, the amount of biomass that's being lifted on a woman's head, um, the amount of time it takes um, what we do know, uh, despite the, the lack of data being collected, is that these trends have actually exacerbated again from the time that Bina collected this kind of information uh, back in the mid-80s to now, largely because the sources of biomass have become further and further away. So in other words, the unmeasured quantum of women's work um, has become staggeringly more. And it's spectacularly invisible in both scholarship and in public policy. It's, it's amazing that sort of these very material computations of women's labor have been missing from both policy as well as academic scholarship. Uh, it's one of the big tragedies, I think, of the environmental literature that we've got to correct uh, going forward. Um, Bina has been um, very clear about what the impacts are, and, and you might if you read Nussbaum, begin to start to see some of the comparisons. And part of where my own affinities and where I was drawn to it, uh, Martha's kind of argument, is looking at the need for some form of universal protection, both legislated as well as in terms of policy. When you've got situations like this, as a consequence of the time and distance that women's labor entails, collecting primary uh, produce, if you will, um, look at these are women headloaders. This is the kind of you've all probably lift uh, put food in the and put you know fed fed fireplaces. I don't know what you do in Chicago, but in, uh, we still do in, in California. But, uh, these things are not they're pretty heavy um, to lift. Um, so what this does mean is that it's got severe consequences on health. Uh, it's got severe consequences on nutrition. Women are already fed less. Uh, because the male child is privileged. Uh, and yet, as the graphic, which tells a thousand words, shows uh, they probably need more nutrition to do this kind of physical labor. Um, if you spend all your time doing this kind of work, you really don't have social networks. Uh, you don't have time to hang out and build community. So as a consequence, those communities, extended families, kinship networks are broken. And strikingly, there's been a lot of de-skilling as well. There's something I myself have discovered in my own research, that if you looked at what grandmothers have been able to do uh, in terms of their knowledge of seeds and the variety of other skills they had, compared to the, the, the girl children of today, 
uh, these kids today don't really have the skills their grandmoms had, simply because they're spending most of the time doing this. So the problem here is the, the fact that there are very, very clear gender class impacts of environmental destruction. And the challenge here is both an academic one as well as a policy one. I mean, the academic one is to understand this. We need data. We don't have it. It's preposterous and unacceptable. We don't have data. And we don't have data for a lot of the world. Um, and of course, if we have the data, then we've got to figure out you know, what do we do about this and, and what then is, is a policy kind of thing. But if you ask me what is the single biggest agenda, if you will, it's this. It's got to be very critical in the sustenance thing. This I'll kind of run through very quickly because it's much talked about in the sustenance uh, literature, if you will, which is that uh, because of the onset of large, big development projects like dams and power stations and so on, you have this phenomenon of what are called ecological refugees. That is, primary producers have been kicked out. Um, these are people who are, in many cases, skilled agriculturalists or tribals with uh, very vivid and interesting symbolic cultures who suddenly find themselves without skill pouring into urban areas as unskilled labor, uh, treated very badly, extremely marginal, invisible, liminal. Um, this is the condition of a lot of the humanity today. Um, the graphic itself is simple. The, the names on the left are project sites of dams. Uh, the bars that you see are the millions of people who have been displaced in each of, the, each of these sites. And the World Bank claims that about 40 million people have been displaced in the last 60 years. Activists say that the number is much bigger. We're talking India alone. I mean, if you look at the global trends, are, which I outline in the book, they're far worse. Um, and less than a quarter of these people, according to the government of India, which is inflating figures in the opposite direction, have been um, resettled. Um, then you've got, uh, you know, what are the obvious issues with this, you know, which is trauma. Uh, you've got, I mean, I've got seen some the odd psycho, psychological studies which kind of are akin to post-traumatic stress syndromes among millions of people. Again, vastly understudied. Um, the inability to eke out a living that they knew, uh, which we talk about, undervaluation of compensation, problems with resettlement sites, criminality, that whole gamut of things. Underemployment, no safety set, no safety nets. Uh, the delegitimization in the eyes of, say, bureauc bureaucracies and middle classes and so on that go with the kind of de-skilling, with the kinds of skill sets that you need to survive in urban complexes these people don't have. Um, of course, breakdown of community, and as one leading Indian activist said, uh, coined the word ethnocide to uh, describe uh, the complete breakdown, if you will, of an entire cultural worldview. So the point here is that this kind of displacement worsens poverty by making the economic and social lives of millions of people unviable. Um, and as human beings, they're, they become caricatures of what they can be. So it's, it's the exact opposite of what development is meant to do, which is to build to use the old German word, Bildung. It's the opposite of that. I mean, you actually take well-cultivated people and make them caricatures of human beings, essentially. And part of the bigger challenge, and I put lots of words out there, is I think the bigger challenge is to understand this, uh, of what actually has been happening. Um, of course, uh, it's been said for a very long time. It's been graphically depicted. There are thousands of films on this. Um, and yet, uh, it's not there. It's not visible in government or multilateral um, systems at all, barring an odd palliative from you know, Government of India report to the World Bank report. I'm going to quickly run through the uh, security uh, dimensions because I'm kind of almost halfway there to begin with. Um, this is the dimension of security. Is the, if, if the problem of sustenance, as I described, was the problem of the presence of these bad environments. And because of bad environments, they de they de the quality of life declines. The problem with security is the presence of bad environments. So it's, the, it's, the, it's a presence of bad environments. 
And uh, what I have here is, is numbers, data, essentially. Uh, again, coming from India, on three different dimensions that speak directly to human life. Uh, indoor air pollution, outdoor air pollution, and water pollution. You can look at the slides. I'm not going to go through all the numbers. They're pretty obvious. But I'm going to just thread back to the point about gender that I made uh, a couple of slides back. Uh, what we've got is an epidemic of uh, cancers among women, uh, particularly in the hill areas. And thanks to some very, very good people in the public health community, the Indian National Census measured it for the first time in the National Census. It's become a census category. We're finally counting, which is a good thing, uh, because at least what was invisible has become visible. And the point about this is that wet smoke contains extremely carcinogenic chemicals. And when you have unventilated dwellings, uh, particularly in winters and so on, um, women and girl children are facing the brunt of inhaling wet smoke, with the result that you've got a whole bunch of complications. Um, Endocrine disruption issues are not just a problem of the Rust Belt in the US. Um, you've got an epidemic of endocrine disruptive problems um, in the developing world. And I've tried to sort of pull together all the literature. And it, it, it's pretty frightening when you actually, when you do a meta study of the kind that I did, to actually just look at the numbers. Because uh, behind the numbers are human bodies. And behind those human body counts is a tragedy uh, you know, of enormous proportions that is so easily avoided by better design, ventilation, better systems, and so on. The point here is that we need both technical solutions, which are actually there. That's the funny thing. I mean, there have been lots of, lots of, lots of technical questions. But we still haven't understood or cracked, whether it's in the public health program, way of thinking, or in the appropriate technology framework. Why is it that these proven technologies haven't scaled? What are the institutional dynamics of this? Uh, what are the economics of this? What are the behavioral aspects of this? What are the cultural aspects of these? These are interdisciplinary projects. And part of what I argue heavily in the book is that, and it's probably, I mean, the trend of my arguments probably becoming more and more clear, that to one of the fundamental ways of addressing environmental justice is to do research. I mean, we are key to this. I mean, I'm not sort of playing up the academic thing, but we've really got to understand this. And we really haven't, don't have much of a handle. For example, in the case of women and cook stoves, um, why, what, what do we need to do, for example, to uh, incentivize the adoption of other technologies? I mean, I've, thought, I've documented cases in which alternatives have been posed uh, with large government of India investments. Um, and they've not been adopted. The cook stoves are sitting unused. So what is it about this? And we need to get a better handle of this kind of thing. Sanitation's another big thing. I spend a lot of time in the book talking about toilets, which are huge. Uh, and again, toilets are very gendered, hugely gendered. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to speak about it here, but I'll leave it to your imagination to, to figure out what that means. Um, but it's an epidemic, and it's got its problems. I'm going to throw up an example uh, on which I did a lot of my early work, which uh, was on following the... Um, this is the second case to explain another dimension of uh, security, uh, which is the case of Bhopal, the gas disaster that killed about 2,000 people or more than half a million people uh, and their progeny are currently affected almost now 30 years after the event. It's been 30 years almost after the event. And what I want to pick up on is something that's not been told in the Bhopal story. I, I, I'm probably the only one who's told it, and I don't know why. Um, much of the Bhopal story is, has been rendered as the story of a runaway American corporation that has double standards in the third world. Um, I've argued that the narrative is wrong to begin with, because if you actually dig up the history of Union Carbide, it has a pretty diabolical track record in the U.S. itself, and it's something I've documented. So this is not a case, and there's a later slide that says that. Um, so this is really not a case of a corporation that has double standards. It's a case of a corporate culture. And we've got to understand that as a way of beginning to understand 
but get into the question of what do we do about and cases like this, whether it's here or in the third world. But the part that's been neglected is expertise. And in the book, I actually draw contrasts with FEMA and differential investments in FEMA under different administrations. And the point really is that investments in expertise and capacity and infrastructures to support those expertise are fundamental to reducing vulnerability. Right? We start with Katrina. It's very similar with Bhopal. And I kind of, in the book, sort of really build the, contrast them carefully. I'll quickly mention three things here. Right? The idea of contingent expertise, um, which simply means the capacity on part of a responsive system, the state, to respond to a contingency, I mean, on a contingent basis when something quickly happens. So we've had a disaster yesterday, two days ago, I mean, a few days ago. Uh, and we've seen a fairly decent, from what I can tell, just reading the newspapers, response to the event. I mean, people have gone in, crews have gone in, are rapidly mobilized. When Sandy happened, you saw the same thing. Uh, when Katrina happened, you didn't. When Bhopal happened, you didn't. So you get what this really speaks to is levels of investment in contingency, in contingency work. That's one dimension. This investment and contingency is a huge part of environmental governance. It's not enough to merely have the expertise. It's then to go to the next level of actually putting in the infrastructures that are there. In the case of Bhopal, you neither had the expertise nor the, um, nor the infrastructures. And in the, in the written work that some of the students have read, I've, uh, it's there. So I've documented some of this stuff in my, in my own publications. The second thing, which is, which is kind of very difficult, and this is kind of an um, important category, is conceptual. I'll give you one example. I was interviewing a commissioner of rehabilitation in Bhopal, and sort of basically saying, like, why the hell aren't you doing your work, essentially? And um, he says to me, look, just look out of my window and tell me what you see. I look out of the window, sure enough, there is a bunch of people with wooden tables sitting there. And what they're doing is filling out claims forms to process um, the uh, ex gratia payments that the government of Madhya Pradesh, the state, offered to those affected by the, by the thing. But as bureaucracies go, bureaucracies require proof of victimhood uh, before cash disbursements can go out. But how do you prove that you're a victim? Um, well, you prove it through a instrument called a form, along with supporting, supporting documents. That's, that's the way bureauc bureaucracies recognize it. But of course, you don't have these ways of doing it. So what you do is that you exchange a percentage of the excretion payment for the manufacture of the supporting documents. And that's what those guys are doing. In, in under the nose, directly under the window, of the Commissioner of Relief and Rehabilitation. Um, he told me, then I asked him, um, why don't you do something about it? At which point he gave me a wan smile and he says, you're a young man, go and find out why. So I did. And what I discovered is that there was actually a double entry bookkeeping going on right through the entire system. Every cent was accounted for. And there was nothing the commissioner could do because every one of his underlings beyond the, below the officer level was complicit. A shot of firing everybody, which he couldn't do anyway. Um, there's nothing that could be done. Interestingly enough, in my recent field work, in fact, just a few weeks ago, um, I was interviewing somebody in Microsoft in Bangalore. And they've got an office, uh, an R&D unit in India looking at new, they've got these sort of, how do you expand frontiers of software into the developing countries? Interestingly enough, Microsoft has developed a, a form of software, essentially, which allows you to dodge taxation. So if you're a small business, for example, or like a small sh shop, and you don't want to do the ledgers by hand, uh, you just punch in one number, and it cranks out one set of reports for the official system, and one for you to take account. Microsoft has developed this software, knowing full well that there is a large market for corruption software. Uh, that's sort of where we're headed in this brave world. So the point really is that how then does a state respond conceptually to 
solving a problem that's under its own nose. These are wicked problems, not of a scientific kind, but of a social kind. And they're not easy at all. They're very, very difficult. And we've got to figure this out. Ethnographic expertise is another category that I talk about, you know, which is um, uh, simply the capacity to, for a bureaucracy to understand the plight, in this case, of a victim. What is entailed in filling a complex form, to take my example again? Forms aren't the simplest things to fill out, as anybody who's tried government forms are. But particularly when they are forensic and they're complicated and legal in, in, in ways like this, um, they become very difficult. They could, as I argued uh, in, in a brief to the government, um, they could have simply said, uh, let's cut the losses. Let's forget the legality of this. Uh, lots of people who don't deserve the payments are going to get money anyway because of manufactured evidence. We might as well simply have a simple form and make sure that a lot of people get money and thereby cut the middlemen out. Um, you know, you're just cutting, it, it's a question of how you dice public policy. Bureaucratic systems have complicated difficulties with this because it violates due process. It violates the very principles of governance. It's difficult to do. But if one begins to actually listen ethnographically to what's going on, what it, the amount of energy it asks that takes to fill out a form, when I, the kind of thing that I've been advocating actually begins to start making sense. And maybe we can have changes in constitutional systems that allow for these sorts of cutting corners to take place. It's human. All right. Um, I'll probably just skim through this. Again, agenda motif, right, running right through this. Um, in the Bhopal case, um, you... Uh, you had a problem of not being able to figure out a classic EJ problem of causality. What, what actually happened? Why did, people, why did people suffer? Why are they getting spontaneous abortions? Why are they um, getting the kinds of symptoms uh, that they're getting? The simple etiology didn't add up. You know, for, we just couldn't understand. This is a problem not just of Bhopal, but it's endemic within the public health literature when it comes to EJ. Uh, this state's full of some pioneering studies has been done have been done here, and the Illinois EPA has done some really very interesting work in sorting all this out. Really pioneers in this. Um, but the problem is that uh, when you're not when you when you're unable to establish causality directly, the question of diagnosis can only take one of two forms. It can either be pragmatic, meaning you pragmatically use symptomatic forms of treatment, as the case may be, and treat people. Um, or you begin to chase one or another thing that happens in the list of causalities in Bhopal. There was actually a philosophical di dispute that broke out between two sets of doctors, one of whom claimed that, I'm going to just be pragmatic. I'm going to treat this. This was the dean of medicine. He said, look, I, I, don't, I don't see a causality here. And all I can do is symptomatic treatment, bronchodilators, steroids, that kind of thing. On the other hand, the chief pathologist, and this is the medical college, two colleagues, one is the dean of pathology, one is the dean of medicine. The dean of pathology says, I've done thousands of uh, autopsies, clear case, case of cyanide poisoning, and you've got to give the antidote to cyanide, which is sodium thiosulfate. There's a huge controversy. They ran this thing. In fact, I myself was one of the paramedics who injected um, sodium thiosulfate. Um, worked, we did six injections. It worked in populations for a while, and then they came back with the symptoms. So both sides were right. Complicated, classic kind of uncertainty kind of issues. And then you had the question of representations of symptoms and official diagnoses. And I'll take the gender question uh, again. Um, Women were, they basically said, look, they're faking. They're prone to hysteria. I mean, that's very interesting. That, that whole hysteria thing, I mean, for those of us who followed this, I mean, I've been sort of reading up as a result of this on accounts of women in hysteria. It's a big literature out there in, in historical scholarship. But interestingly enough, that very same argument about hysteria, they, 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 that's crazy. You know, they just, uh, they're getting fired up and getting you know, faking symptoms. The Indian Psychological System Association, I think it's called, coined the term for people's expressions. They, call, they coined the term compensation neurosis. 
basically saying that people are actually faking all the symptoms in order to be claimants for compensation. Interestingly, there wasn't much compensation around at that time. So that in itself was kind of a misnomer. So what I'm arguing here is missing expertise and to really understand what expertise is. This is the subject of my current book, actually, this whole business about engineered conflicts is about missing expertise. Um, and of course, poor become a critical dimension to this. This is an easy enough slide. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. It simply makes the point that uh, the victims were undersold and that the effective compensation levels that were given by Union Carbide were vastly lower than any comparative metric, for example, US standards, for instance. This is the standard grist of the Bhopal story anyway. So, But part of what I've been arguing is that this is not a case of double standards. If you actually study Union Carbide, um, it's got ha biggest EPA fines, longest history of environmental violations in the US, et cetera, et cetera, before it got incorporated within Dow Chemicals, which is another exhibit of the same kind of uh, corporate entity. Lastly, I want to talk about, uh, and I, you know, okay, okay, I'll quickly do this. The last slide on, on security, which is uh, an extraordinary c comment that I found when researching the public relations entities. Uh, like everything else, Union Carbide hired a PR company. And uh, you can actually Google this and get the actual article. It's there by Harold Barston, who was the CEO of the company that advised uh, Union Carbide. And it said a, a, a corporation cannot compensate for its inadequacies of good deeds. Its first responsibility is to manage its own affairs profitably. We should no more expect a corporation to adopt a leadership role in changing the direction of society than we should expect an automobile to fly. The corporation was simply not designed for that role. I mean, this could be said by Tim Cook, apropos today's, I mean, what's going on in, in the current dimension. But the point here is that, you know, we, there's one way to relate to this. All of us who've got families uh, and have retirement plans, or in, in my case, it's a university that does it. I, I, I know nothing about finances. But I know that they're investing in, in, in stocks and mutual funds and so on. So I, I'm implicit on this. And ultimately, my retirement is predicated on this, on this exact philosophy of these corporations um, coming through for me in terms of profitability. So. Rather than blame Union Carbide or a PR company, let's understand how implicit and complicit we are. It's a much bigger ontological issue that's got to be addressed. And I'll come back to that later. I'm going to end on the security thing, and I'm going to rush through this because it's big but not easy enough to understand. I argue that there are three ways of pushing the idea of suffrage. One of them is information access. This has been one of the... Uh, the great stories of India in the last uh, you know, 10, 15 years. I mean, there are bad stories, but this is one of the great ones. There's good stories, this is one of the great ones. Um, you enacted one of the most amazing Freedom of Information Acts, uh, which require every government in entity to appoint a Freedom of Information Officer who has to provide data requested within 90 days. And they can be jailed if they don't do it. There are actual legal there's teeth in this thing. Uh, and it's, it's, it's revolutionized it. There are portals, information portals that have come up. Um, there is uh, um, all kinds of uh, stuff coming out. It's become one of the uh, fundamental reasons why these 24 new, our new channels have been able to unearth scandal after scandal after scandal. Um, and, and I think the, the unearth unearthing of these scandals is not a failure of the Indian system. It's actually the triumph of this in the fact that the fact that it's coming out and that governments are not being elected again because of this. Uh, that no, in fact, no government's been elected again ever twice in the last 20 plus years. Is, in, in my respects, uh, if you will, uh, the success of a democratic system, the fact that we are blessed with terrible politicians uh, is another problem, but that's at least it sh this shows some of the institutional possibilities. The second thing is uh, 
slightly more complicated, which is about participation. Um, to go back to the gender theme again, um, how do, and Bina has been writing a lot about this, about this question of what happens when women get the right to make decisions. Um, India has had a very interesting and very successful experiment with women's representation. It, it, legally, a third of elected representatives um, have to be women in, 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 in local governments. There is a, an act of parliament that is being legislated upon uh, which may make this a reality in the national parliament as well. Uh, many local governments, uh, again by rotation, have to be headed by women. This is a law, it's a national law. And we now have a lot of very, very interesting data that's come out that shows that this has had an effect. This has not been an empty thing. It's actually had significant impacts in terms of resource allocation, kinds of investments that take place, in terms of things that directly affect the material lives of women, essentially, and girl children. So this is significant. So this kind of representation becomes very, very crucial, and it's a positive thing. But there are lots of other things that have not been done, particularly in the industrial domain. Um, questions about relocation, resettlement. Um, it's an untouched question. And no, one's get, no one who gets displaced gets polled about this. Um, and, and there's really no framework at all to, to talk about this. Setting of hazardous events, which is a huge big thing about nuclear um, about the setting of a nuclear power plant recently, a Supreme Court decision that said it's got to go through. We still haven't wrapped our head around this sort of thing, and I don't think anybody has. So here, it's an absence of representation and consultation and participation are these fundamental things that directly affect the, the, quali of the quality of life, the very basis in which people can actually live. And we've got to find real constitutional legal answers to make this happen in ways that are uh, in, in consonance with the frameworks, constitutional frameworks. Um, here, I do make U.S.-India comparisons because the Indian Constitution largely drew upon the U.S., in fact, more than it did uh, with, the, uh, with, with Britain. Uh, some of the basic principles come from the U.S. Constitution. So in that sense, it's an interesting, I, I kind of look at a lot of U.S. rulings and so forth. But the last part, um, and this is my penultimate slide, I promise you, is about what I call cognitive justice. So what about plurality and diversity? What about the, the rights of these people? You know, uh, what in India are called tribals. Um, there's a fundamental cultural incommensurability between their aspirations and the aspirations of a consumptive middle class. Um, do they just go into a museum of lost causes. I mean, I do think we need to build a museum of lost causes. I mean, I think we need to do it. Maybe it's got to be done on the internet. I, I want to do it. It's got to be something that, it's like a Wikipedia product. We've got to look at every culture that's been destroyed in the past 500 years and bring it into the human consciousness. It's part of who we are. Uh, but what do you do when they're alive? What do you do when they're outside the citizenry? Um, they don't even want to vote. They don't understand the systems of governance. They don't understand the concept of a nation. They don't care about it. But they want to live. They've got the right to live. Here I'm torn between a Nussbaumian-like universality on the one hand, uh, inoculate them, give them access to welfare, etc. And on the other hand, the particularist anthropological sensibility which says, look, this is a living culture. They've got the rights to live. Here I'm ambiguous. And I write my ambiguity in the book and say, this is difficult. I don't know how to deal with this. Um, and you know, so the question is, what do we do with life, destruction of life worlds? And I think that we've got to have semiotic discussions, which are very hard to do when public discourse is devoid of any kind of symbolic uh, meaning, import. When, if, if public discourse is primarily constructed in economic and legal terms, what do you do with symbolic universes, which are at fundamentally at stake? Uh, every, every, every country has dealt with this. I mean, the US did, uh, and it still does uh, in many respects with Indian, Indian tribes and so on. And we're doing this in India too, and many other countries, Australians are doing it, and the Canadians are doing it. Uh, but the fact that I'm trying to point out is that these people exist, and in fairly large numbers, if you actually add them up around the world, which is what I'm doing in the book, wow. We've got a global problem. 
and it's not it's not something we can wish away. I'll kind of end with this last slide. So where do we go with this? And this is sort of the broader where I'm at at this point, and I'd love your feedback on, uh, on, on this is the theoretical drawing out. And what I'm trying to do with this is to give each of these things a philosophical and legal, bi a legal basis by looking at case law, looking at uh, other kinds of examples from around the world. And I kind of simply do a you know a simple thing of a three by nine, three by three matrix, looking at the looking at sustenance, security, and suffrage. So, I define sustenance rights as the rights to ecologically viable systems, um, gender rights specifically as women's rights. In fact, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to rephrase this and not just simply call it gender because it's a it's too broad a category. When, whereas in my book, I'm specifically talking about women, and it's so it's. Let me rephrase this and say women's rights. And lastly, rights of livelihoods, rights to livelihoods, and culturally appropriate rehabilitation uh, alternatives. So that's the gamut of sustenance rights. I'm basically arguing that we should be able, in some way, to derive these rights. Some of them are easier. The first two, maybe. The third one, because it's so interpretive and complicated, I'm finding difficult. Uh, to actually derive in, in a way that's legally valid. Security rights uh, is easier because we have good, good case law from around the world. Um, the right to safe living environments is kind of recognized across legal systems now. The rights to expertise and functional institutions, again, is there, but we can bring it out and make it more explicit. The rights to accountability and rights to redress um, are not there as rights yet around the world. Um, people, like, people agree that these are good groundworks for governance. But to go from there and leap into saying that these are rights is an important step that I argue in this book that we should be making. Lastly, suffrage rights are break down into information access to begin with, rights to uh, participation, consultation, representation on specific environment and issues that matter to people, not just electing somebody, but issue-based representation, um, something that actually directly impacts your life, that, that level of representation, which is at the core of the environmental kind of problem. And I put a question mark around the last one, you know, which is, are there rights to plurality and diversity? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, now, what I'm going with this book is that I think that no scholar, leave alone a low, lowly academic like, my, like myself, can really provide answers to these kinds of questions. There are too many intangibles. There are too many valuation, questions of value choices that are to be made. But where I end the book is by pointing to one of the biggest, in my view at least, one of the biggest um, uh, achievements, if you will, born out of a, another great tragedy in the 20th century, which is the Holocaust. And I'm looking at how Nuremberg and the people who work Nuremberg handled that atrocity. Um, they could have legitimately killed uh, a lot more people, executed a lot more people than they did, um, clearly. I mean, by, by most grounds of civility, uh, people should have been executed. Um, they want. Uh, and, and sometimes when I read, uh, you know, when you, when you, when you read, read, the Holo read about the Holocaust and about what happened, and when you read the, go through, as I've done, the testimonies in Nuremberg, you, you, you are, you're kind of left wondering what happened here and why. Um, and, that, and, I, and I recognize that that itself is a very complicated question as to why it is that so few people went unpunished in this way. But what was what did the positive thing that came out of it was a set of was a kind of a at least some kind of global consensus on responsibilities even in the wake of state mandates. Um, you can't any longer as an official claim that you did something because you were told to do so. There was a soul searching that took place. I think that in the case of the environment, we've been very, very light. We've had a number of Earth summits which have really been about saving the planet. Um, that's good. 
nothing against saving the planet. But I think what is obvious to me that the environment is fundamentally material to the lives of people directly. It, it's, it's, it's as big as food, right? So we do need to rewrite the OED to say that sustenance is more than food. When you do that, and then you derive rights out of that, uh, something much bigger can emerge. But it can't emerge easily, because even the right to food uh, is resisted by the US. I mean, we and Saudi Arabia are the two countries that resist the International Treaty on the, rights, on, on the Right to Food, uh, which is kind of odd. So there's a lot of consensus building that needs to take place. So I think that what I'm suggesting at the end, and maybe it's something that I want to try and do with a lot of other colleagues, is to kind of to do a Nuremberg, to have a collective value-based discussion, not an IPCC, which is about facts, about what's going on in climate change, but a discussion of values. I mean, for example, there's a New York Times article that came out a few months ago which basically said that one of the leaders, one of the CEOs of a food company, I forget which, basically said, we are causing obesity and all these sorts of health issues. I'm going to host all the CEOs of all the basic junk food producing companies. And let's just agree not to produce this and to clean up our act. And if, if we all do this, then we're not really competing unfairly. You know, we get to innovate and so on. And apparently, according to the New York Times report, there was quite a bit of nodding of agreement going on in the room. But there's one guy who basically, I forget which one it was, which company that was, he said, no way, they're not doing it. And the whole deal fell through. Now, I'm trying to imagine that these guys, are, these fellows are sitting in front with testimonies both from the scientists and as well as people who have been victims of obesity, et cetera. And on the other hand, People like myself, who just yesterday was guilty while waiting for the, for the airplane in San Francisco of going to Burger King and buying myself fries and, and, a, and a burger because I wanted comfort food after flying 20 hours from Singapore. So it just felt good. We're all complicit again. But I think ways of talking about the kinds of universes that we want to live in, what we consider to be normatively right, is, one, is a place to start. Because if we have a normative argument, and I'm going particularly back to that kind of British ethical theory, Stevenson and others, which say that ethics is, is a social construct, essentially. It's what we want to make. So unless we really have a discussion about ethics, about the kind of world that we want to live in, which incorporates these kinds of questions, the environment is simply going to be about facts. And part of the human rights and environment agenda is to argue that it isn't just about fact. It's fundamentally about discussion about worldviews and values in a fundamental way. Uh, we need to go back to this discussion. It began in the Enlightenment. We've got to shake hands again in Voltaire. We've got to read Candide. We've got to go back there. And we've got to ask, OK, so what have we done in the last 300 years? We've emancipated a lot of people, a lot of economic prosperity. Great things have happened. But then we've got all of this, too. Now what do we do? Um, what's Candide version 2013 look like? What's our agenda? And that's kind of what I think uh, we should do as a collective entity. And this is going to happen through a dialogue. Uh, maybe we can leverage the internet and connectivity to make this kind of thing happen. What those are are things that I'm, I want to think about with, with other people. So thank you very much. The, uh, the merit of this, of the, the whole millennial, the millennial uh, assessment projects, is the commitment to um, peer-reviewed, fact-based projections and extrapolations. Um, what it's produced is some very good trends for us to play with. Where it's failed, the problem, um, 
fundamentally is that it has not told us how to understand the institutional as well as behavioral change components of how these goals are going to be realized. Um, so we're left with the relatively small toolkit that we, all, that we conventionally have, building sort of piecemeal markets for certain kinds of services to be delivered, uh, forms of optimized solutions, etc. But as I pointed out, uh, these kinds of questions aren't optimization questions. Uh, they're fundamentally about what goes on underlying political economic dilemmas, the value of people, the undervaluation clearly in the right through my narrative about of one half of the humanity. In fact, it isn't one half of the humanity, as you know, because there are lesser women than men. Um, these are questions that are fundamentally about what we what we what it is to be human. Um, so the millennials, uh, the whole assessment project basically does not, in a fundamental way, question the growth narrative in any fundamental way. It doesn't question the terms of global trade or, or the terms of the global economy at all. It basically sustains a fiction that the externalities, if you will, that the global system has produced could be addressed by some kind of scientific understanding of problems. Um, I am completely in concurrence with the need for the scientific understanding. So there's no, I have no quarrels with my science colleagues at all. Um, the quarrel I have uh, is also our own failing as scholars. I mean, so let's not blame other people. Uh, we've got to, in environmental studies, really fundamentally think institutions in, in complex ways, not just interdisciplinary ways. That's a very old term, but in wicked ways. I mean, what is it about behavior? What is it about political economy? How do we understand what, why people do certain things? I mean, you know, the, the grist of 1960s anthropology would be done differently, you know, to really understand culture in a different way. I don't think it's general at all. I mean, I, I mean, we've got to we've got to be economic about how we do these things, and. Uh, you know, for example, um, there are enough commonalities in a lot of my gender cases. I mean, in fact, my book is not a country by country thing at all. I mean, it's deliberately not that. Although today, to focus it, I did one country. Uh, but, you know, the trends are clear. Now, exactly why, you know, what a place of a girl child is in one country might be, it might vary from one place. It does vary considerably. Uh, value propositions change, are different. Um, but we've also had interesting examples about cultural change. Um, I mean, uh, I, I document the fact, consumer behavior is, for example, a very interesting thing. So one of the things I've been doing in this, in this part of this research is interviewing guys in advertising companies in India. You know, about, you know, things like, I interviewed this guy who created this amazing campaign to get people, poor people, to buy branded tea. They go to a tea shop and buy tea, just ask for tea, and they get leaf tea, and, this was a real problem for the Liptons and the Brook Barnes and et cetera, et cetera, because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't forecast essentially what the hell's going to happen on a quarter big. So they had to convince people to buy a particular brand, and that meant that this 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 person would go to a shop and say, "Don't give me tea, but give me a Lipton," right? And that is a huge big shift, a cultural shift. And he basically said, look, you know, you give me, you give me anything, and I've got the semiotic buttons that I can push. Um, so if that expertise exists among the advertisers of the world, uh, which it seems to, um, we've got, they are, they are our allies. I mean, these are very clever people. And I think part of what makes this kind of project interesting is that we've got to go and get these tools and actually tie up with these people. I mean, we've got to work with these these entities who understand what, how to script stories, about how to move people, how to shift behavior. We've got to think out of the box, I think. It's not a term I coined, it's, it's a Dutch term. The, the Dutch have been, a uh, bunch, bunch of universities and scholars in Holland have been um, using, have coined the term and have been using it. 
basically what they're saying is, traditionally when we look at infrastructures, we think of states pushing systems to benefit subjects, essentially. So you build roads, you build dams, you build airports, you build you know, large big systems that are in the public good. The assumption is that the aggregate entity, the state, acts on public, in, in, in the public interest and spends public monies to build things that are going to benefit people. That's the basis behind this. That's good. That's perfectly fine. However, what slips through the crack are infrastructures that communities need, um, which don't get recognized by the state. I mean, to give you an example that's in the book, one of my grad students' research, actually, um, she discovered, for example, that in that big debate about dams, which is largely construed as should we have dams or not have dams, she discovers this community which basically says, look, we need, we need water. We need it distributed over this entire area. But we don't need a large dam that's going to basically divert the water to some, some other place. We need a small dam. So they went ahead and they themselves brought in hydrologists and engineering experts from outside and redesigned a small dam for themselves and built it by, them, by their own labor and came up with rules of use and access and, and payment schemes and so forth. And they commune it and they build it and run it. Um, that's an example of an inverse infrastructure. In other words, a community decides that it needs to build an infrastructure. The state doesn't recognize it. It doesn't come from tax monies, but it gets built. So that's what I meant, yeah. But where it can be spun off and what the Dutch are doing is basically saying, look, we can loop back community needs back to the state, because if the state belongs to us and there are tax monies involved, um, what should be built should come from the community through forms of communication. And they've built these very interesting systems like science shops and so on that enable them to do that. Uh, but Holland's you know, way advanced compared to <laughs> the kinds of places I work. I think we are, um, the answer is uh, it has to include corporations. It's got to. It's got to. I think the timing is also very good because uh, the FT, Financial Times, for example, had a report that shows, that surveyed the big uh, business schools, including this one, including Booth, um, and the motivations of uh, recent MBAs. And very, very large, surprisingly large number of people uh, do not want to be doing dirty things for a living. Uh, they're interested in sustainability. They're interested in human rights. They're interested in the kinds of issues that we're talking about here. Um, businesses are very, 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 very um, aware of uh, supply chains following climate change perturbations. Increasingly, because of you know the very good social work that's taken place by you know by public social movements. Um, they're increasingly aware of human rights in manufacturing processes as well. So there's a lot of pushback because of the media thing that's taken place as well. So for purely, purely economic reasons, there, is, there are many companies who kind of buy into the idea that it's actually good business practice to do these things the right way. Um, so we actually have a groundswell of the middle management kind of thing that kind of broadly agrees with these principles, essentially. The problem is competition. Well, how do you operate when you've got a competitor, for example, in the, in the, for example, in the case that I mentioned, in the food industry, that wants to get people addicted to uh, sodas and junk food and so on? I mean, they're going to win. The, they're going to win the economic sweepstakes, sweepstakes. And I think there is research to be done there too. And I think, in a sense, is a case for a lot of us working with in, in business school environments. I certainly am going to do that uh, in figuring out okay, how do we do these things. In fact, I'm kind of doing a coffee table book, you know, with with a with a, with a friend of mine who's a CEO, company guy, who you know, who's a very interesting fellow. But we're actually looking at cases, examples in India alone, of entrepreneurs, uh, you know, who've built businesses really cool companies that are socially disruptive. I mean, I'll give you one example. Look up Microspin, M-I-C-R-O, spin, Microspin. 
great example. It's a company that I've, uh, you know, that I know pretty well and, you know, work with fairly interestingly. Guess what they did? Um, it speaks to the history of the American South, but it's an Indian story too, um, which is that cotton would be produced by manual labor, or cultivating the land, get compressed by the Ginny, shipped off to Lancaster, where it would be then spun into yarn. You know, um, it caused labor problems in India. It caused labor problems in the American South, and indeed plantation cultures everywhere in the world. So the primary producer of cotton didn't get paid, or got paid very, very low wages through history. But the entity that could actually make yarn um, made the bulk of the killing. The question was, how do you then make, get the, is it possible? for the producer of cotton to be able to make the yarn, in which case they get to sell yarn at a much higher rate of profit. This company decided that, it, the, or the guy who created it, decided that he was going to solve the problem, and he did. He created a system quite like, you know, Xerox or Singer, in which this company goes in, sells you, or leases you a machine, which it maintains for you and operates for you. You take the cotton, but you don't compress it. You actually make the yarn in the, in the backyard in your own home, and then you sell the yarn. Profits have gone up 220 percent in the last. And these are in 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 parts of India where there were farmer suicides barely 10 years ago. Um, so what we've been we've been showing case after case that there are this tremendous. So in fact, there's a, there was a book many years ago by a guy called C.K. Prahlad called Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. You know, looking at you know, how poor people can be engines for creating companies' revenue streams. We're actually riffing off that. We're saying embracing the pyramid. I mean, not, not fortune at the bottom off, not ripping them off, but basically figuring out ways of creating win-win scenarios that create economic opportunity for people at the base of the pyramid. This whole business of, if you will, uh, a new kind of business environment could be really, really interesting. Uh, it fires at people, if you, if, you, if you identify opportunities, I think there, there's, a, there's a lot of money to be made on drinking water, sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because people are paying services anyway, paying money for these services anyway, through taxation. And all that's happening in, in developing countries, India being a prime example, is that it's getting siphoned off to their own hands. So you might as well then embrace a different kind of rhetoric and build scaling, scaled up systems that address a lot of these questions by providing solutions. A large, big companies can come with this. Housing is another great example of largely scalable. There's absolutely no reason why uh, 10 years down the line, 10 years from today, uh, anybody needs to live in a shanty town. There's no reason. We've got all the technologies in the world to house people. Uh, we've got a lot of capital sitting uh, in crazy places un underutilized. All the money that Apple's got sitting in Ireland can be put to use through interesting investing mechanisms to create, create um, this kind of wealth. I mean, we've got, we've, got, we've got a ton of money. If you actually study, start studying wealth in the world today, um, and, and the problem that, that capital has of trying to park itself somewhere. And the whole point of capitalism was, was to put it to use. And I think what we've got to do is be, at least for, I'm speaking of a Santa Cruz academic, you know, sort of loads capital and so on. Um, is that if we begin to start opening ourselves mentally, as I've begun to do, to the possibilities of what could happen, and begin to understand the workings of capital and, and, and the market and so on, we can create lots of interesting disruptive systems. But it's got to be done carefully. It's got to be done not in a Frederick Hayekian sense. It's got to be done in a, in a Polanian sense of building embedded economies in which economies are embedded within societal choices rather than being seen as autonomous entities of change. These are going to be technologies of social policy, carefully thought through. And it's, it's civic citizenship that's got to be at the basis of all of this. But I think it's, it's an exciting time, but um, it, it calls for a different, an entire reshaking of what we do in the academic world itself. Uh, and that's, that's a big ask, but I think it can be done.
I kind of alluded to that at the beginning and in the paper that I circulated as well, um, the classical environmentalism one. Uh, I mean, traditionally, uh, since about the 60s, when the term environmentalism got reframed from determinism to an ideology, of an affective ideology about the world, um, the question has been about what is humanity's relationship with the rest of nature? It's us versus the rest of nature and that relationship. Um, and I think what the EHR, the environmental human rights kind of idea says, is, suggests, is the prospect that the environment is fundamental to who we are. Who we are. I'm not making value calls on whether, on, on, on the old debates about Anthropomor uh, you know, anthropomorphism versus you know, whether, whether, I, whether animals are rights and whether creatures are rights. I mean, uh, I love my cats, and I, anybody who's lived with animals knows that uh, they have sentience, they have sapience, and they have free will. I mean, my cats clearly got all three of those things. I mean, both of them do. Um, I'm not going there. Uh, I think it, it can, reasonable people can disagree about, about that, that ethical thicket. Uh, and it's been worked quite a bit. In, in the environmental ethics literature. Instead, what, I, what I've been arguing is that the rights literature has traditionally been about critically important things. Um, I pick on one of the big ones, the gender one, because that's been, that was one of the first issues that came up uh, with, the, with the suffragacy movement. Uh, and it's not just for that reason that I picked it up. I picked it up because it's central to the environmental story. But that is one of the first um, things where what was obviously not right uh, was there was a consensus began to emerge that this was not right. Slavery was another one. The whole race thing was another one. There was, a huge, there was another consensus that um, Roderick Nash, in fact, has a wonderful diagram of, of how these things evolved. Um, in the 20th century, you know, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, We've had other things. Uh, the FSA in the second Rooseveltian administration was huge, the Farm, or the, farm the Farm Security Administration. The work of Dorothy Lang to bring back anthropology in this, I mean, uh, to show bureaucrats images of what it was to migrate from places like Oklahoma, the Dust Bowl regions, um, brought about a completely different imagination of what it is to be human. So clearly at that time, you already began to move from a pure issue about food, as food rights began to emerge, of course, fundamentally as part of that agenda, uh, and food for right programs emerged, etc. cetera. Um, but what also happened at the same time was the recognition that soil erosion caused the food crisis, and this was recognized very, very much. That's why the Bureau of Land Reclamation was created, and these sort of big federal initiatives began to take place. But what's and, and sort of interesting aside is that one of the things that's kind of disappointed me about Obama in the first administration, I mean the first, and probably running into this, is that when they look back at history, they only brought back Keynes. When they should have looked at Dorothy Lang and the F Food Security Administration and, and so on, because there's much more to the New Deal than Keynesianism. I say Obama was huge in this. I mean, th there's a whole bigger ethnographic semiotic sensibility to the New Deal than a purely economic one. And surprisingly, that whole story of the, oh, bless you, of the, of the New Deal um, has been told simply in terms of monetary policy, and it's a mistake. And that's part of, uh, of course, in this political environment, to do anything is, is difficult. I'm not blaming the president for anything. All I'm trying to say is that our history is much, much richer than this. And so what, when I talk about sustenance, I'm not inventing anything here. I mean, I'm, I'm actually explicitly drawing from the American experience because, in fact, I, I argue that I kind of contrast that era in the US with what went on in the Soviet Union um, and, and the neglect of agriculture uh, because of the communes and so on. And there, it is interesting that both Hayek and Polanyi uh, and Arthur Kessler, all of them, the Viennese, you know, they hated each other, but they, they kind of, in the Yogi and the Kamazar, for example, Kessler really lays into uh, Soviet collectivism by basically arguing that it basically takes agency away from the cultivator. And he predicts an, an agricultural disaster that came to fruit with Khrushchev. 
At which point, the Khrushchev administration imports American capital. Campbell went. Uh, Deborah Fitzgerald's documented this very well. America, they, they sort of reimagined re, re the Soviet agricultural landscape on the basis of Kansas. Um, but it didn't work. It couldn't work because it had broken traditional Russian peasantry and because it was so delegitimized by the modernizing discourse that came with, with the Soviets. Um, what the Americans did very well, uh, on the other hand, was A, gave a terrific education to people who hitherto could never afford education through the land-grant system and building this. They created forms of expertise in things that really are fundamentally valuable, like, like agriculture, for example, and so forth, animal husbandry, and so on. So suddenly, you had expertise which actually built a nation. It wasn't just the war and so on. It built a nation. Thirdly, they gave access to capital. It wasn't capitalism, necessarily. It was the fact that a Robert Noyce, who came from a very low economic background, could go to Grinnell College, and then subsequently could get the money to start Fairchild, which then became Intel. This, this is American socialism. And part of what I've, in this chapter, I've got the sentence that says that, uh, in a sense, if you look at it, the Cold War, the victory of the Cold War was not a victory of American capitalism over Soviet socialism. It was a, it was a victory of American socialism over Soviet collectivism. But it was a very clever form of socialism, which involved um, very strong investments in people with the ability to reward and recognize and be able to give people access to capital to create enterprises. That's what built this country. And in a sense, what I'm arguing at the end in terms of liberating and embracing the market economy and so on is very much in this vein. I'm, I'm looking at this kind of broader narrative of what, from my eyes, um, made built America in the 20th century, which is this fascinating period post the second Roosevelt Indian administration, which is not equal to Keynesianism. This is the big mistake that's being made right now. They think it's Keynesianism. It isn't. It's much, much, much bigger than that. And until that narrative is written, uh, we lose it. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.